Kaya and Wanju, hello and welcome. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on where we're speaking from, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, also extending that acknowledgement to uh, the traditional owners of those of you around the country at the moment and around the world, I guess. And also extending that acknowledgement to all First Nations people who are in attendance today. So firstly, a little bit about us. Um, my name's Mandy Downey. I'm an Inchibati woman. I work at Curtin University in the Faculty of Humanities. Um, my research interests are in the decolonization of research policy and institutional racism within the academy. Uh, my family descend from the Pilbara region of Western Australia, where my grandfather and his sisters, the Lockyer children, were taken, removed, and then raised at Sister Kate's Mission, which is loca located just south of Curtin University. But I have grown up here on Wanchuk Noongarbudja. Um, I have worked for several years at Curtin as the research ethicist. And um, in the community, I co-facilitate an emerging leadership program for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth aged 18 to 25. And I guess external to my work, I'm on quite a few committees, mostly in research ethics, um, including the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies uh, Human Research Ethics Committee. Peter? I'm Peter Jiddick. I'm a white coloniser and I experience the privileges afforded to the coloniser in Australia. My whiteness is normalised and I'm in culture to think that my privileges do not exist. My mother was born in Australia and is of Irish Catholic descent. My father is a Muslim refugee displaced by war and settled in Australia as a child. I'm a senior lecturer here in the School of Psychology at Curtin and I have a teaching and research role. So I guess we should explain how we became acquainted. Yeah. So we met when a series of ethics applications that I submitted for review were elevated to a non-low risk human research ethics review. I was a research supervisor of fourth year psychology students. These student, students are not Indigenous, but each of them had and hold strong social justice values and a growing interest in the rights of Indigenous Australians. The first semester had been spent where we worked and collaborated on developing their uh, research projects and we'd submitted their ethics proposals for review. Successful completion of their research projects is crucial for graduation, so it was quite time sensitive. The research projects all considered Australian coloniality by recasting the research gaze to explore the views of the coloniser so to move away from the historical problematizing of the colonized. Absent from the research proposals, however, was the, incorpor um, the incorporation of Indigenous lens and standpoint. This was a critical omission and prompted a call from Mandy from the Eth Ethics Office to inform me that the projects were not approved and instead would have to be resubmitted for full review by the, ethics, the, the University Ethics Committee. My initial response to the news that my research projects would be elevated to non-low risk review was illustrative of white fragility. Mandy's offer to support me in making right the ethics applications was highly significant. Through this, a friendship between two strangers was developed and we managed to lean into the discomfort of my white fragility. And also it illuminated the way and ways in which the ethics approval process was systemically and culturally violent. Through ongoing dialogue, we have identified a number of different subjectivities that Mandy can and has occupied when delivering bad news to white researchers. To demonstrate these subjectivities and the typical response Mandy has received from fragile white researchers, we're going to enact the dynamics that occur when Mandy delivers those, uh, the, the bad news. The first scenario depicts where Mandy upholds the institutional expectations at the expense of cultural integrity. The second scenario 
depicts the reality, the second scenario rather, depicts where Mandy upholds cultural integrity. And this third scenario depicts the reality of our first phone call where Mandy engages in epistemic disobedience and she really leads that process. Following this final scenario, we're going to unpack the exchange between us to demonstrate the nuance of my fragile response and reflect on how our first conversation grew to an ongoing dialogue and its impact. Okay, I'll start off with the first scenario. Ring, ring. Hello, this is Peter. Hi, Peter, it's Mandy from the Ethics Office. Um, I needed to speak to you about your recent applications for human research ethics approval. Um, I believe it's two, two or three student projects. Um, unfortunately, there's been an error in the office and uh, they've been assessed as needing a low risk ethics review, whereas they actually need to go through a high risk or non low risk process. Um, so the difference being that that process is going to take about two months for um, you to end up having an ethics approval, providing all goes well. Um, um, sorry, I'm just gonna have to interrupt you here. I'm just really curious as to what has prompted a sudden change here. We haven't, um, this review process, it's never been the case that studies of this nature within our school has had to be elevated to non-low risk review. Is what, what has happened here? I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused. I... Well, it's in the national statement, there's a requirement under section 5.16b that um, any research which falls within the chapter 4.7 um, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or topics needs to go through a high risk process. Mm, no, but sorry, that's very contrary to everything that we've been doing for decades within this school. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, something has changed in the office that we haven't been notified about because that's simply not the way that we do our work. I wouldn't have proposed these sorts of projects and engage with my students in this way if I'd known that this was, wasn't going to be actually tenable. There's serious implications to my students to actually graduate. Under this scenario, it would mean that I would have to let them know that the last semester of their final year of university was a waste of time. They will not be able to complete their research projects and they won't graduate with their peers. Um, the more I think of this actually, uh, the more I think that it might actually be necessary for a larger conversation to be had with the head of school and also the, probably the director of research from our school because this, what's being posed here, poses serious threats for the way that we go about our work. Would you be, um, when would you be available for such a meeting? Um, I, I don't think it needs to go to that extent. Um, uh, what, I, what I'll do is I'll speak to my manager and see if maybe they can just go through low risk on this occasion. Um, that's okay, Thank we'll you. just leave it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Ready for scenario two, Peter? Yeah, thanks, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> okay, so scenario two is me honouring my cultural integrity um, and giving Peter the serve of a lifetime. Ring, ring. Hello, Peter speaking. Yeah, hi, Peter. It's Mandy Downing. I'm calling you from the Research Ethics Office. Um, this is about some of your ethics applications for a few student projects. Um, what's happened is we've identified that your projects were, well, they're incorrect in that they have been submitted for a low risk review, but they're actually non low risk and they've got to go through that process. So I don't know what you were thinking by thinking they could go through a low risk process because clearly this, this research is going to impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. 
you can't go and talk to people about us and not engage with us. This isn't appropriate. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to elevate the review. Uh, the timeline is going to change from a week to two months. And um, if any of the projects have already started or been given approval, that's going to be revoked and you will just need to pause any data collection. Um, so what we're looking at here is section 5.16b of the National Statement on Ethical Conduct and Human Research Ethics clearly picks up on chapter 4.7, which is where your research projects lie within. Um, and quite frankly, it's really offensive as an Aboriginal woman to review these projects and see that you're assuming they would be going through or maybe more so expecting they would go through a low risk review process. It's really quite irresponsible if you, Peter. And um, so I'm calling you to let you know this is what's going to be happening. And anything that's moving forward, you're just going to have to put a pause on that and wait until you hear back from our committee. Okay. okay. Thank um, you. Thanks for serving. Okay. Um, okay, so now are we moving on to scenario three? Yeah. Which is a bit closer to what actually happened. Yeah. Ring, ring. Hello, Peter speaking. Hi, Peter. Uh, my name's Mandy Downing. I'm calling you from the Research Ethics Office just about uh, some of your ethics applications which came through. Um, unfortunately, there's been a little bit of a mix up in that the office have identified them as low risk and I think they might have like, advised you of that. However, on further assessment, we've noticed that this does need to go through the Human Research Ethics Committee for review. Um, unfortunately, that's probably going to take a bit longer. So. I don't know what the impact is to your students, but this is going to take uh, closer to two months to go through the um, non-low risk process. Um, but I can assure you, you will be able to get through the process. So I don't know if there are things at the moment that maybe your students can get started on, whether that be planning or working on their data instruments. Um, Maybe there's some things they can do until that approval comes through. Um, I guess what I'd offer is if you'd like to work through these together, I'm happy to come and provide, I guess, an Indigenous lens, which might help you construct the applications to assist in a more timely approval through this process. Um. Um, thank you, sorry. I'm just a bit... Um shocked because it's not at all what I was expecting um, as a as a process. I thought I had been leading um, my students through things properly. Um, and so I'm just a bit uh, um, surprised, I think, is probably the, the best um, way to describe things here. Um, but, so just because I need to make sense of things. Would you be able to just uh, uh, um, tell me what part of the natural, um, I can't even speak, um, what part of the national statement um, I haven't picked up on that I was erroneous in? I'm sorry, I've, I've got a pen. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, it falls within chapter 4.7, I think, from memory, chapter 4.7.6. Um, so when the topics are of relevance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and can potentially impact upon them, it's what then um, makes the project become of a higher risk. So that's why it will need to go through that process. Um, look, as scary as the process may seem and time consuming, I can assure you that I can work with you and we can certainly get the application in the best best place possible um, and we'll be able to push that through and get it approved. Uh, it just needs to go through that process. So 
Um, if there's anything I can do to assist, if you'd like to catch up and we can have a bit of a yarn about it and um, work on it together, I'm very happy to help. Just let me know. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, I would, I would really like that help because I don't, I don't really know what to do here. I thought I've been doing things right, so I'm really sorry that I've, um, that I've made such an error. Um, I don't really know how to fix this, so I would really, really appreciate being able to work with you and. Um, so thank you for making that offer. So I'm really worried about what this means to my students because I don't want to hold them back because I was an idiot. Um, if we could meet next week, um, would you be free? Because I need some help, I think. I don't want to. Yeah, no problem. Look, we can catch up. I'm, uh, I have plenty of time on Monday. So if you'd like to send through a... a a time that suits you. Um, I can come to you or you can come here, whatever works best for you, and we can work on it together. Okay? Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just shocked. But thank you so much. I'll send through an invite. Okay. I'm Sorry. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks. Bye. On. So it's Bell Hooks has noted that white people who conceptualise themselves as the least racist, often become the most angry when confronted with people of colour, viewing them as white. She states, often their rage erupts because they believe that all ways of looking that highlight difference subvert the liberal belief in a universal subjectivity that they think will make racism disappear. They have a deep emotional investment in the myth of sameness, even as their actions reflect the primacy of whiteness as a sign informing who they are and how they think. So with this scenario, my non-Indigenous colleagues didn't want to be the bearer of bad news, which is the epitome of entitlement. For a person of colour to disregard their feelings to educate a non-Indigenous person in a way not to cause them discomfort. However, in this scenario, it was necessary for Peter and to become vulnerable. Together, we're going to take you through the challenges we experienced through this process. So the challenges, they've, they've evolved over time. Um, Peter, what did it feel like for you? Um, as you would have seen, um, quite frozen and fragile. So I was caught between the demands of supervision and the requirements of ethics, and I felt powerless. It was the first time this coloniser researcher was in a position of vulnerability, and I didn't like it. And I was not ready to contemplate my whiteness at that point. Um, in time, I began to thaw, and this thawing, though, was through meaning making. So Mandy facilitated my process of critical self-reflection. Thank you. And I began to explore my vulnerability and my white fragility as a standpoint to which I view the world. And things are beginning and have been uh, feeling more fluid. So our relationship has continued beyond the immediate task and our conversations are dynamic, respectful and co-determined. I feel strengthened, but I do not feel in need of regaining power. So how did it feel or what did it feel like for you, Mandy? For me, initially it was burdensome. It felt like having to go to work with the worst hangover imaginable. I had no existing relationship with Peter, nor the research teams, and was unsure how the ruling would be received. 
I felt obligated and somewhat torn because this was my job, but also a, a cultural responsibility to ensure cultural integrity within the research. I got complicit here and that was because I was in a position where I could influence positive change by way of cultural integrity. If I chose not to take the path of epistemic disobedience, I would be seen as the professional Aboriginal as opposed to the Aboriginal professional. So moving on, um, what did it sound like to you, Peter? Silent. At first, I did not have the words or language to express how I felt. Silence enabled me to be cautious and serve to protect myself and my students as I contemplated our options. To me, I immediately identified that I had two choices. Firstly, deal with the issue by processing it and doing what needed to be done through the ethics process. Or secondly, abandon the ideas and start afresh. That moved on to um, apology quite rapidly and how I dealt, and um, this is how I dealt with shame and guilt in getting things so wrong. Apology serves to alleviate discomfort through the hope of forgiveness, <laughs> but Mandy did not offer this. This was crucial as it kept me vulnerable and meant that I had to keep processing things. And increasingly it's been sounding conversational. So how we speak sometimes makes me think that this is what is necessary for and to engage in reconciliation. So how did it sound like to you, Mandy? Well, when I first contacted you to discuss, it was silent. Um, apart from some sobbing. Uh, it was uncomfortable. I spoke calmly, but with assertion. I heard discomfort at the other end of the phone. So much so that I contacted a colleague in the School of Psychology, who was also an ethics committee member. Um, they happened to specialise in non-suicidal self-injury research because I really wanted to make sure someone could go and physically check in with Peter to make sure she was okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and educational. Um, I guess changing that narrative for what Aboriginal people and particularly an Aboriginal ethicist might be um, was probably a very different experience or at least rare. I reassured Peter that we would work through the applications together which was eagerly accepted. Um, and finally, Peter, what did it look like to you? At first it looked like failure, particularly, um, yeah, and this is particularly complicated because it gives the impression that the ethics system was unjust to me, but that's not the case though. It's important to highlight that. Um, but then it moved to perhaps looking like triumph so after going through the ethics process, it may have looked from an outsider perspective, like I had triumphed the system, but again, I hadn't though. I did what should have been done in the first place. So I think that's an important distinction there as well. Ultimately though, it looks dangerous. So the perceptions by colleagues of me and the ethics process has led me to my current position that the absence of Indigenous standpoint is incredibly dangerous, given the, the risk this introduces to the community. It, I find it really astounding that the institution does so little about it. How did it look like for you, Mandy? Um, it looked dangerous, uh, similar to our little friend in the corner of the side there. Um, I was battling with myself to push my feelings aside in order to educate another in a way that was sensitive to manage their white fragility. Certainly looked courageous. We were both vulnerable, yet willing to lean into the discomfort. And for me, there is an element of fragility um, in that I was hoping not to reach a breaking point with Peter, which re then resulted in a complaint against me. I felt fragile in that I was attempting to defend both the research integrity and cultural integrity standpoints, all while trying to operate in a somewhat filtered and professional manner. Okay. So 
My Right Fragility has served as a bit of a case study for us to make sense of the system and recognise the degree to which the system is set up to the advantage of white researchers. We recognised that we have been embedded within an institution that sympathises with the coloniser researcher. The institutional processes do more than soothe or absolve the white researcher from feeling discomfort. It actually nurtures the sense of entitlement and encourages it to grow. That is, unless we don't let it and don't encourage it to grow. To inhibit this growth meant that Mandy had to put herself on the line and led the discourse of epistemic disobedience. So critical hope does not obstruct purposive and critical reflection around one's complicity in systems of oppression, but instead encourages a willingness to be fully alive in the process, a constant change and becoming. In light of this, I needed to find courage, a lot of it, and ground myself to have a calm and reflective conversation about decolonisation and to dispel any white noise that was surrounding it. So from a conversation, things have grown. What has changed for me is that I'm beginning to explore white fragility more in my teaching and supervision. And I'm finding that students seem more, more forthcoming in sharing with me that they are Indigenous. I use myself as I have today as an example and tell the story of my failings of my ongoing development and make it explicit that in order to develop further requires I continue to lean into the discomfort. Learning requires unlearning and relearning. The ongoing conversation with Mandy has been transformative for me. I think about the use, um, how Mandy uses words um, and I use words differently now. Mandy has modelled to me the power attached to the intent and purpose of words and it has changed me and it's changed my ethic as well. I'm eternally grateful for this um, and so too Mandy's courage to facilitate this with me and for the friendship that now exists between us. So thank you, Mandy. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I guess there has been a ripple effect from this interaction. We've had an ongoing working relationship which has blossomed into a friendship I sometimes feel that I've become that annoying little voice in Peter's head, which pushes her into ongoing discomfort and advocacy. But it's, it's so useful to have someone who hears the little voice and acts, particularly in Australia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up between two and 3% of the national population, which means we are reliant on our co-conspirators we can't make change on our own. We just don't have the numbers. Since these events, Peter and I have shared with the Australasian Research Management Society um, in an effort to create an awareness of the violence within research institutions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff in Australia. Further, Peter and I now deliver a lecture about this topic to her community psychology students. At first, I thought, how on earth is this going to go with a room full of mostly non-Indigenous students? To my surprise, I was amazed when leaving the lecture theatre that these students were gathered outside reflecting on and discussing their white fragility. When on earth did this become normalised? Later, I was thrilled to learn that an impact of this lecture was two of the students identified themselves um, and that's identifying with their cultural heritage for the first time to Peter. This is something I can relate to through my own experiences as needing to hide my cultural background when I was younger due to the concerns of another stolen generation. It was pleasing to think something so simple as both Peter and I willing to be courageous evoked courage in others to embrace their cultural heritage. Now the lecture is part of an annual curriculum and it includes readings about concepts such as white fragility. I celebrate Peter's innovative approach in changing her curriculum and have discussed this with the Aboriginal community. 
So from these communications, some Aboriginal psychology graduates who had felt unsafe during their study have since heard of these changes and now been inspired to pursue postgraduate studies. What we've demonstrated today is really that from little things, big things grow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mandy.